so I tried to answer honestly the, the question, no, the, the, the issue that's raised, you know, by this uh, series of uh, symposiums and exhibition, and uh, which is the relationship between art and philosophy. And I think that the only way I could manage to to provide an answer to it, in a way, was to uh, was to um, take it from the back in some ways, which is uh, actually talking about what's exactly the opposite of art and philosophy, which is the ideology, the zone of the mechanical, of the reflex, of the automatic pilot, in some ways, of societies. Uh, we could define, in a way, uh, ideology as a kind of social unconscious, uh, and that's exactly how it goes against art, both art and philosophy. So that's what I want to address and start with uh, today. And to, to address this question of uh, the ideology, I started from a reading of uh, the texts of a philo French philosopher who actually is not that used in, uh, in contemporary theory uh, when it comes to uh, contemporary art. His name is Louis Althusser. Uh, it's not exactly, you know, it's not discussed the same way as uh, many others because he has a very specific history actually maybe I, I can remind it you know um, if, in case you don't know the work so he, he actually died in 1990 and he was actually the teacher uh, of uh, Jacques Rancière, Chantal Mouffe, uh, Alain Badiou, uh, Brigitte Debray, well the whole generation of, of uh, French philosopher coming from the, the 60s actually so it's, it's a kind of a very interesting character who is actually have, has a very specific history because he, he was uh, actually most of the time psychotic uh, and he had a very uh, serious professional life at the Ecole Normale in Paris and at the same time every year or so was going to the, the um, uh, psychiatric hospital for very serious uh, uh, mental disease. So he's an if actually uh, his career uh, ended up in uh, 1980 when he actually uh, killed his own wife. Uh, so it's not exactly a, uh, uh, a typical uh, character of, uh, that's the least we can say actually. Um, and uh, of course it's always a bit uh, strange to talk about, about, about him. But um, in his kind of psychotic, in his kind of craze, actually, he was also, he developed, you know, very interesting reading of Marxism uh, from the, the 60s, especially in the 60s, uh, re-reading Marx through, through the grid of structuralism and uh, making a kind of connection between Marx, structuralism and uh, Lacan and psychoanalysis um, in general. So the, the reading of ideology, which, is, which was the main theme, according to me, uh, of Louis Althusser's work, uh, has been, of course, influenced not only be, of, by his personal experience, of course, but also by his intense and deep uh, reading of Jacques Lacan's theories. The um, way Althusser um, brings ideology as a philosophical topics uh, in the mid 60s is coming, uh, I was saying, from his personal experience. It's also um, coming from this intuition that he had from scratch that ideology works exactly like the unconscious. It's exactly the same way. Uh, and his reading of Lacan then will help him actually to solve the problem in a way and to develop a, a very new theory of uh, ideology. Let's get back actually to, because I was saying at the very beginning that the, un, the ideology is exactly a kind of social unconscious. First we have to precise uh, what a subject is. Uh, and uh, as you know, uh, in the Marxist reading of history, the subject of history, the leading character 
of history is the proletariat, the working class, the, the, the main agent of the, the, the process, historical process is, according to the Marxist theory, the proletariat. So the main agent is a social group, not uh, this or this person. You know that you still have this, uh, this um, in a way, uh, old-fashioned way of thinking about the providential man, you know, coming and, and uh, make, making the history move. It's not at all uh, what's developed by uh, Marxist theory. Althusser is refining even this idea by saying that history is a process without subject. Does not even, in a way, in a way even the proletariat is kind of erased uh, in his view of history. It's a process without subject. You know, it's something that, a structure actually that, that grows and develops by its own means in some ways. And taking, starting from this point, Althusser defines the individual subject, but in a very, very specific way also. Uh, the subject, you, me, everybody in this room, um, according to Althusser, is intersubjective. It's uh, produced by intersubject intersubjectivity. And this intersubjectivity that he mentions has something to do with ideology. <clears throat> Let's see first how Althusser is defining ideology, what it is exactly. He says it's a representation of the imaginary relationship of individuals to their real conditions of existence. So it's a representation first, not of something real, but of an imaginary relationship. That's really important. And this imaginary relationship, this set of imaginary relationships, is linked to something which is real, which is the real conditions of existence of people. He refines a bit later this definition by saying, by writing, the function of ideology is to ensure the link between people throughout their forms of existence, the relation of the individuals to their tasks set by the social structure. So we see here that ideology is not a content, it's not a specific matter actually. Today we say generally there's no more ideologies. For example, how many times did we hear that? Ideologies are gone, you know, etc, etc. But it has, it has no sense in some ways, because ideology is not some, a set of uh, a content, or whatever it is. It's a specific relation between people, and more precisely, a relation of subjection. As individuals, we are transformed into subjects, says Althusser, by a very specific process which he calls the calling out that Althusser compares to a, almost to a police uh, interpolation. And I, I, I read a, a small extract from Positions, which is a, one of the, the um, important, you know, um, uh, collection of texts, you know, uh, where you can find the, the, the main uh, text he wrote about uh, ideology. And this text starts like this. A, you dare, assuming that the theoretical scene, this theoretical scene, takes place in the street, the hailed individual will turn around. A, you dare. By this mere 180 degree physical conversion, he becomes a subject. Why? Because he has recognized that the hail was really addressed to him, and it was really him who was hailed, and not someone else. According to Althusser, the subject is constituted by an ideological hailing, like a policeman calling you in the street, which means from the outside. Ideology, in this way, is a kind of factory of the subjects. Today, we, let's say, what would 
play this role of ailing you in the street. For example, it's advertising. If we take a very simple, a very simple example, advertisings, poster bills everywhere in the street, hail you, actually. They are transforming you if you feel uh, called out by them, if you recognize their call, they transform you into the subject of the consumption sphere in some ways. You are transformed into a consumer as, assuming that you know, you are part of this ideology. Transformed as into a very, a very specific type of subject. It's a subjection, let's say. This, this idea of the ideology is very close to uh, a psychoanalytical uh, way of putting things. You know, it's, it's very close to a Freudian uh, uh, text in some ways. It's, uh, Lacan at the same time was saying the unconscious is structured as a language. And as human societies are also unconscious productions, containing of course this ideological uh, sphere, and because they give off and produce signs, every, like every city, every country, every society, and they transform and they receive them, and they transform them into the, according to the specific needs. So we can accept the idea, which is really important when it comes to art, that societies are structured as a human unconscious, exactly the same way, and they are functioning the same way, and so they are also a language. So every environment, our environment, is structured as a language. And uh, it's a linguistic uh, system we're caught in, within. More precisely, there are two things that determine the scope of our experience, which are desire and language. So our social environment is a linguistic fact. You know, we have a permanent dialogue with it even if we don't recognize it, even if we just are so much used to it that we don't recognize some calls out as the way they are. So this is, it's this language that the artist has to master and articulate in some ways, with its symbols, its metonymies, its uh, repetitions, its uh, metaphors, etc., etc. Any human society is a way to speak the language of reality. When I say language of reality, it might sound strange. It's coming actually from the, um, the a very interesting set of texts that uh, Pier, the, the, the Italian filmmaker Pier Paolo Pasolini wrote in the 1960s, where he was speaking about cinema as the language of reality as the written language of reality, as a way to articulate, you know, uh, a discourse, whatever it is, you know, not using a system of signs to represent it, but just using the things themselves, actually, which in a way uh, take us back to the 1913 and uh, the invention of the ready-made by Marcel Duchamp, what, because what was it, actually? It was exactly the same idea uh, that actually came from the invention of photography and cinema. And the ready-made of Marcel Duchamp is exactly this. You don't represent something, you just install it in front of a camera. And the camera for the ready-made is the gallery space. Uh, it's a recording device. It's a, a mechanism that allows an, any object to be recorded uh, within it. So, so the ready-made on one side and the definition of the cinema according to Pasolini are in a way functioning the same way to talk about the written language of reality. In a way the artist, uh, artist is like a psychoanalyst and he or she functions exactly the, the, the same way when it comes to understanding and deciphering the language of the city, the language of uh, society, in some way. Because what, what, what is a psychoanalysis? It's the reorganization of the, your memories, uh, a kind of uh, 
chain of signs that you are used to make function in a specific way, and the psych psychoanalysis r obliges you to uh, rewrite this narrative, to uh, coordinate the, the signs and the elements of your own past into a very different narrative that you had no idea of before. So that's exactly, in a way, what an artist does uh, when he or she is uh, using material from reality, either representing it or uh, articulating its elements into um, an installation, for example, or a, a gesture, whatever it is. Uh, I used to um, find a term that defines this new way of uh, envisioning reality, which is post-production. You know, an artist can post-produce reality. And post-production, according to me, is not like quotation. Uh, it's not quoting uh, what has been done, it's not uh, using it uh, as a, a quotation of reality. It's um, a specific regime of the use of what is already done, actually. Uh, the already done, the already produced, is a material that's um, high, highly and uh, heavily important uh, today. If you take on the music uh, side, for example, the, the DJ has become, since the, the beginning of the 90s, the, the a main cultural figure, uh, actually. And a DJ uses already existing elements in order to reorganize a chaining of sounds. That's exactly the way an artist is functioning today. It's this rearticulation based on an interpretation of reality, of the environment we are living in, which is different from every uh, society, uh, that is the basis of any artistic uh, process. But let's go back to the analogy between ideology and the unconscious. In uh, a text called The State Ideological Apparatus, uh, Althusser writes that an individual is always already a subject, even before he or she was born. It is clear that this ideological constraint and pre-appointment and all the rituals of rearing and then education in, in the family has some relationship with what Freud studied in the forms of the pre-genital and genital stages of sexuality, which means in the grip of what Freud registered by its effects as being the unconscious. So here Althusser really insists on the fact that we, are, we don't only have a, an individual unconscious, but also we are living within a bigger unconscious, which is uh, something we don't necessarily notice um, neither. More precisely, he writes that the subject, the human subject, is decentered, constituted by a structure which has no center neither. Its only center is in the, let's say, the unknowledge, méconnaissance in French, the unknowledge of the ego. And this unknowledge, what it is, he defines it as the ideological formations in which the subject recognizes himself or herself. So the decenter, our double decentering, I would say, is coming first from our unconscious, what we don't control or master in ourselves, and what we don't control or master within the society. In other words, we could say that um, the relation of any individual with society exactly duplicates the relation he or she has with his or her ego. The ideology, as the unconscious, decenters the individual who cannot consider himself or herself as in control. So the individual is subjected, it is submitted. But this process of the constitution of the subject as a social being 
goes along with another process that Althusser calls transference, like transfer, let's say. The individual, he writes, is running on transference or transfer, whatever. This is so our main energy supply is transfer, according to him. It's an intersubjective, inter-individual energy that we all have, actually. And that, that's our main source of energy. Transference in, in a, any psychoanalysis is um, a shift of emotions, especially those uh, kind of emotions that we experience in childhood, from one person to another, generally the psychoanalyst. And so, um, Althusser goes on with this uh, analogy, saying that first, proposition one, history is running on class struggle, as a motor runs on gas. Two, the individual runs on transference in his or, or her relations with other individuals. So that's double idea that first what history what's the energy supply for history uh, it's class struggle so the fact that there is one social group that might you know uh, and of course we can discuss this you know infinitely but uh, that's uh, i'm trying to transcribe the the the, the way uh, althusser thinks uh, and then the individual needs as a source of energy you know this transference between people, actually. And it, it goes back, something that Althusser doesn't write, but which is very interesting, to the, the um, Marxist theory of the trans individual. You know, uh, as you may know, in, in Karl Marx's you know, writings, um, especially in the manuscripts of 1844, uh, there is no human nature. It doesn't exist. There's not such a thing as human nature. You know, it's something we build by our intersubjective work, by, by our relations, actually. The sum of our relations is human nature. That's concretely what Marx writes. There are only relations materialized into institutions, objects, forms, etc., etc. And, uh, of course, th this, this uh, Marxist intuition uh, was the, the basis for the, 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 the text, the book you were mentioning, um, which is Relational Aesthetics, which was an attempt to consider art not only, uh, let's say, as from the point of view, from the sphere of inter-human relationships and uh, to try to see how this uh, insistence today on the interhuman was literally producing in the artist studios a new way of seeing uh, the art and uh, what it produces and what it could produce in the, in the future. In a way, w but I'll come back on it maybe. Um, what's interesting in this idea of the transference, according to Althusser, which is as I repeat, very close to uh, some processes that you can see in any psychoanalysis, is the fact that it, mean, it means that the translation is our mode of being, in a way. We need translation all the time. It's our main energy supply. At the subjective level, uh, in the individual's subject, uh, as Lacan said, this is the idea of the displacement. To say something, you point out something else. To express a certain type of pain or you know, feeling or whatever, you shift from this object to another one. We're always translating unconsciously and we're also translating consciously in our very social uh, way of uh, living, actually. The second aspect of um, ideology, actually, of course, is the fact that it's a passive thought. 
That's why it's totally opposed to art and philosophy. Passivity is the second uh, characteristics of uh, what ideology is. This kind of cloud of ideas that are received ideas that we don't even realize we do have. Uh, it's passivity. So what? It's interesting to look at what what's going on today in art and culture according to this couple: activity, passivity, actually. Because uh, at this point, uh, I'm also coming back to the very first sentences I've been, I've been saying, you know, the, the definition of the contemporary subject throughout ideology uh, could be uh, followed by another you know, question, which is who or what is the subject of history today? We're mentioning as something very, you know, casual that for Marx or any Marxist thinker, uh, the proletariat or the, the, the working class was the subject of history. Is that still true? That's something we could, of course, you know, largely discuss. Um, especially um, because we don't even have a clue exactly of uh, what history is really. Uh, is it a series of facts, of events that are happening right now? Is that what we can call history? for example. When we even talk about history of art, it's somehow difficult for us uh, in general to specify who, what really is the driving force of it today. And um, history of art, in a way, it seems to be uh, put you know, into the past uh, some ways, and not something which are, that we live consciously. consciously uh, so all this set of problems um, are, according to me, very important uh, today. Uh, one of the main problems we can have today with history is the fact that in the last 30 years, I mean, in the, the, since the beginning of uh, so-called postmodern era, um, we are living a large process of synchronization of times. It was of course, much <clears throat> simpler for any Western uh, thinker or Western historian to uh, refer to a, a simplified version of history which was absolutely Occidental and European or, uh, or Occidental. Uh, of course, then things are much simpler. In the last 30 years, we were, let's say, obliged to synchronize uh, in, in a, on a global level I would say. History is not only the history of Europe and its uh, uh, affiliates. Uh, it's a much more complex uh, idea, and especially history of art, which had to include, in a very short amount of time, a, a huge number of elements. Um, and that's something, I, th I think, which is a specificity of our times. The fact that we are bombarded, uh, not only by uh, a huge amount of artworks produced all around, all around the world today. Actually, it's, it's something which, uh, in terms of quantity, has never been so important. We have to, to consider that you know, to understand our times also. In, in, the la in 1960 or 70, it was still possible for any individual to master the amount of in data, the amount of information that was necessary to understand contemporary art, the idea of contemporary art. Today it's absolutely impossible, you know. No one knows you know, the totality of uh, artists you know, working uh, today on the planet. It's impossible. Uh, it used to be, actually. Uh, and uh, this idea that we cannot anymore master uh, this uh, huge uh, amount of information is something we have to take into account, even to think about history. This uh, synchronization, which was the, the, the main and best, according to me, um, effect of postmodernism, uh, is still going on. It's a process we are still living in, in, in some ways. That's why the, the idea of a unique figure uh, that would 
this imaginary subject like the proletariat for Marx, um, from which the narrative, the global narrative of history can be organized, cannot exist anymore in some ways. So we, we, we cannot have such a, uh, uh, an easy to define subject for history uh, today. We only have certain, if, you, if we look uh, at, the, at today's art, if we go into deeper into the, the galleries and museums and, and see actually what, what are the, the main patterns, um, and of course then we need a huge slideshow just to, to, um, to hold a little bit my, my, my hypothesis, but um, I firmly think that the leading character of, hist of the historical process the leading character of the political uh, process uh, also uh, at the surface of the, of the globe, uh, for me, uh, is the removed, the divested, I would say. The divested, the restless. Uh, according to me, it's the main character of all politics. The individual, the person who's powerless in front of the economical globalization, the spectator of the images industry, for example, the citizen who is given only some zones of social interactivity as a kind of canalization for a political, it is or her political uh, claims, he or she is the removed, you know, the, the individual that's, that has no power in front of, the, of history in some ways. And I think if you really, we, we could get much deeper, of course, into this uh, analysis, which comes to my mind, writing and trying to answer the question of art and philosophy, but I th really think that this notion of the divested, um, the, the restless, uh, is everywhere, actually, in every uh, possible artwork uh, today. The idea of being, not being able to grasp the, 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 the flux of uh, time, not being able to transform yourself, the, the society you're living in, the person who's not able to, to master the huge transformations he or she is submitted to, uh, hailed, like, like uh, Althusser said, called out by, the, by this, is the main uh, character, the, the, the leading um, imaginary subject through which our version of history is being written at the moment. This irresponsible subject that uh, I think is the first, has the first role on the political scene, for example, there's one um, occurrence of it which is the immigrant, for example, the illegal immigrant even more, you know, who's actually so present as a pattern, as a figure, you know, as a character in many, many artworks today. Or all the fi possible figures of impotence in front of the progression of the logics of neoliberalism, for example, that could be also uh, difficult to number. Um, the puppet in a theater play whose director seems to be invisible always somewhere else than where I am. Uh, this uh, abstract world where the, the feeling of uh, irresponsibility is growing um, has been addressed by many artists also in terms of uh, um, by many, many artists trying to um, represent with abstract languages what can only be represented by abstraction in some ways. Diagrams, statistics, the abstract grid is the language to represent the unrepresentable of today's capital, according to me. All the f fluxes that we are impotent uh, in front of uh, which we are, we are totally Im uh, important uh, can only be represented through a very specific set of um, signs, 
which are coming also from the from abstraction in some ways. Some, sometimes also uh, I'm thinking, for example, about the Liam Gillick uh, piece where he, he was trying to embody the vice chairman of uh, Sony, uh, Ibuka, uh, for example. Now it, it might sound a bit corny, but you know, those people like Ibuka. Uh, is the vice chairman of Sony at the end of the 90s when Gillick is doing this piece, has a huge power and nobody knows him. He has no reality, let's say, the same way than the, the, the chairman of, uh, or, or the, the, the shareholders of a company living in Florida uh, have no face for the ones who have who are fired, you know, at the other extremity of the world by their decisions. You know, we're living in a world where invisibility has become the norm in some ways, where the the immateriality of the fluxes have, has become have become the norm. That's what art is, uh, in a way, trying to to fight against, either by embodying or the forces, uh, the economic fluxes or by trying a way to represent them through the abstract grid, uh, I would say. Getting back to this, this, this um, opposition I was mentioning about the activity and passivity, um, I think it's the biggest common theme uh, for the 20th century left wing in politics and the, all the cultural avant-garde's actually. This theme of activity and passivity, you can find it everywhere in some ways. Always you will find this fight uh, for the abolition of the border between, for example, the, the, the power, the government and the mob, the producer and the consumer, the actor and the spectator, the artist and the beholder. This, at the, in a kind of vertical, you know, um, sketch uh, starting from the politics and going to, to the, the avant-garde of the 20th century, is, is a, it's a permanent theme, I would say. Absolutely permanent. This, uh, for example, you know, the, the, let's take only one example, it's the, the, the Situationist International, um, when Guy Debord uh, is actually um, dealing uh, with the question of the alienation of our possibilities uh, to react or to act on the social theme. It's called the spectacle. Um, when uh, the ex-Althusser uh, student uh, Jean-Claude Milner, who actually also is a psychoanalyst and a theoretician, writes a book about May 68, he talks about May 68 as a moment of uh, maximal activity and that's the way he defines it and the way you could define actually any uh, insurrection in history, a period of maximal activity where there's no passivity anymore in the mob, which is not a mob anymore, it's not a crowd anymore, it's something else, it's the addition of a multi-powered uh, multiplicity. And this uh, dissolution of passivity is, according to Milner, the main political struggle, actually. And the, if you tr translate that into the field of, uh, of uh, art, uh, the ancestor for this uh, reflection would be Marcel Duchamp, actually. Uh, the beholder, according to Duchamp, plays on the same um, chessboard than the artists. Uh, both are playing the same game, actually, and there's no, uh, and he doesn't uh, think of his works as produce, producing contemplation, but a game, a kind of dialogue between the two. There is, if you want to, to dig a bit deeper into this idea, there's a, a wonderful uh, lecture that he did in 1957, uh, I think, in Houston, um, where um, he, where he explains that um, uh, 
there's a kind of share between the, the, the beholder and the artist. And it's a kind of, it's a kind of uh, not only a game, but a kind of fight also. And uh, both are actually equal on the same, on the same, uh, on the same board in the same way. That's why uh, also it's, it's a complex game between the artist and, and the beholder. It's not, um, that's why I never talked about participation, for example. Uh, participation is a, is a word from the 1960s, which applies to a very specific set of uh, artworks. Uh, the relational, as I, I'm, I'm, I tried to, to um, mention it, it comes from the fact that actually it is the same game, but maybe not the same role that the artists, of course, and, uh, and the beholder uh, have. Relation, what I called relational aesthetics was uh, the description of this symbolic redistribution, redistribution of the active and the passive into uh, the art process, I would say. In a way, sometimes it can even be the construction of a community, an ephemeral community, where active and passive are not discriminating actually anymore. Even more, I would say that this idea that all those artworks who actually uh, take as starting point the sphere of the interhuman uh, and the sphere of the interhuman relations re inject some humanity within a system that actually is based today on reification, uh, I would say. And there, there are wonderful pages about the idea of the inhuman get progressing uh, every time, every year, um, by Jean-François Lyotard, who is not specifically a, a humanist thinker, uh, but uh, uh, somebody who was a part of the, also, let's say, from the generation of the structuralists. And the spread of the inhuman, of the automatic, as I was saying, of the, the, the ideological, we could say that too, is in a way um, fought against by uh, all those artists who are actually trying to re-inject you know, humanity uh, interactions, uh, but also the preoccupation of the other you know, in their works. And that's why it's, it's more complex than the idea of participation, which is important. If you take Bertolt, Bertolt Brecht, you know, theater, you know, we will see that the idea is not, uh, it's not about participating. It's about the fact that the spectator is the actor that finishes the play, but after the play ends. And that's, the, the, according to me, the most important. It's not live, it's afterwards. And this time play is also very important. Uh, because we are submitted, and it's also ideological, to the dictatorship of the live uh, today, the instant spread of information, the instant reactions that we have to, to give you know, to the system that solicitates us, that hails us, that calls us out, as I was saying from the beginning. Time is the issue, and the way uh, contemporary art is dealing with different layers of time, different um, ways of approaching the historical uh, is also playing against this submission that uh, I was uh, talking about. In conclusion, I, I would say that uh, art in a way stands um, for maintaining activity within the process of reification that I was describing. By doing so, um, one could say that it also creates pre precariousness in some ways. It precarizes reality. It shows us that everything that surrounds us is nothing but a construction, an ephemeral construction, that's the product of the interhuman relations that we have been weaving together, actually. To be able to act on history, 
To be able to be political, one has to know that what surrounds him or her is ephemeral and is not a nature, it's only a, a fragile construction, actually. That's what I call the precarious. And this political task, which is according to me the main political task for contemporary art today, which is maintaining precariousness everywhere, in every of our beliefs, in every aspect of ideology, every aspect of this calling out that I was talking about. You noticed, certainly, that uh, actually I did my best during this lecture not to talk about art or philosophy, actually, but um, to talk about their enemy, actually their common enemy, uh, I would say, which, which was, I named it, ideology. It's actually it's one of the, the enemies in questions, because all the energies that are in opposition to art or philosophy have a kind of common consistence, a kind of common matter you know, between them. We call, can call that reification or commodification, uh, ideology, you can, we can call it fundamentalism also. And all those elements have something in common, actually. They are all stasis in a process. It's a kind of stop button on, on the process of the, this self-constitution of the human nature. It's the being static as a kind of ecosystem uh, in some ways. From this, from this discourse about the, the enemy that I tried to do, one could um, also define art, both art and philosophy, as a permanent process of dynamization, let's say, or even uh, using a Latin word, uh, viator, trip, to travel, viatorization of all the elements, all the forms that constitute the any human society. And uh, I will end this. Thank you very much.